Hey, what's up? My name is Emma. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm going to be talking about a lot of books. I read a lot of books in January. My goal for this year is mostly to read, we'll try to read all the books that I own, which of course isn't going to happen, but mostly just pick ones off of my own shelf. And all of these are actually from my own shelf. So I got through 13 different pieces this month. All of them were just all over the place. I had to read things for different things. Uh, some were just for me. And yeah, it was just a really good reading month because I loved pretty much all of these. All of these had amazing readings. So uh, it's probably gonna be a huge rambly video. Grab yourself a cup of tea or a snack or once again, steal someone's cat. Maybe this time it's a different cat. Let's just get into all the books I read in January. So in January, I picked up The Ice Palace by Tarja Vesos. This one I read for my Around the World Challenge. Um, Vesos is a Norwegian writer and I started with The Ice Palace. I bought myself this book last year, I believe. Um, and you guys know I love winter and winter books and everything. And let me tell you, this was pure icicle devastation. <laughs> this was amazing. I love this endlessly. I gave it four stars. I'm thinking of even bumping it up to a five now just because I keep thinking about it. I only put two tabs in this book, but it's because this book is so deceptively simple. Um, and when you come away from it, you all of a sudden have so much more than you thought you had or were being given while you were reading it. A very brief uh, summary, just because I think it's good to go into this not knowing that much. We are following two young girls who become like best friends, so close basically overnight. One of them is kind of the popular girl at school. I think they're around 11 or 12. And the other girl is a bit of an outcast. She doesn't really fit in, but they become really close friends. The name of this book takes its title from a structure that has been formed from a nearby waterfall. And it has created this ice palace of of adjacent adjoining parallel attached rooms because the waterfall has spurted off and created this ice palace this ice realm where if you are a very small child you can fit into the nooks and crannies and go through it and discover this magical fairy tale-esque world of ice that is very dazzling very reflective full of illusions full of mirages full of images that as a small child or as anyone for that matter you're not really prepared to deal with so when one day one of the girls goes into the ice palace and doesn't return the other girl falls into this grief ice world all of her own where everything is so numb and covered up um, but she also adamantly keeps his promise to remember her friend because as the days go by and her friend is not found um, she feels like everyone from her town is starting to forget her friend the metaphor this man's metaphor of the ice palace um, that is just able to stand in for literally so many things was devastating that's how uh, it becomes so simple because the way that he writes it is very blunt. We have a lot of short, concise sentences, but the ice palace itself is just literally everything. It's something that reflects things. It's something that is built up in the cold and melts down in the summer. It's something that hides things within it. There's also like a bridge across. It becomes this place of boundaries between life and death, between being missing and being found, between summer and winter. Um, it's just so extraordinary. This book also really captures what it's like to be a young person, what it's like to be treated um, by older people who might not believe you, who might not respect you, who don't really understand your world like you do or the intensity of your world. It captures things like walking home alone in the dark um, and what might be on the side of the road waiting for you to swallow you up. But more than that, it just captures the devastation of winter um, and a winter that can gobble a person up whole and not spit them back out until maybe the summer. There's also a huge parallel or reflection or this weird mirroring that starts to go on between the two girls where they become for some moments indistinguishable and a lot of this too uh, happens in the ice palace because it is literally a mirror. Ice itself is also a mirror or can be a mirror. In terms of Sis's world who is the girl who tries to remember her friend who's gone missing, it's so good to see like the way that the ice and the snow becomes like layer after layer after layer there's like a beautiful scene where one of the girls is gazing into a frozen lake and she can see like down the bottom almost all the way and see like these frozen layers of things that have been petrified or 
uh, frozen and congealed and kept in the ice, preserved in the ice. It's just like a perfect metaphor. I think winter and like what writers do with the winter season with winter phenomena is one of my favorite um, literary things and metaphors and um, the subject of metaphors and stuff. So this was incredible. Such a short little read too, but so worthwhile. I love this. I'm so glad I read this. I have another Vasos on my shelf to get to, but also this is so pretty. Look at this. Oh my gosh, this is gorgeous. One of the only passages that I really highlighted because this is a book where I felt like I didn't need to annotate very much what was was, but then when you came away, what it was just became something different. That's not a very good way to say it, but and what was this? It must be the ice palace. The sun had suddenly disappeared. There was a ravine with steep sides. The sun would perhaps reach into it later, but now it was an ice cold shadow. Unlook down into an enchanted world of small pinnacles, gables, frosted domes, soft curves, and confused tracery. All of it was ice, and the water spurted between, building it up continually. Branches of the waterfall had been diverted and rushed into new channels, creating new forms. Everything shone. The sun had not yet come, but it shone ice blue and green of itself, and deathly cold. The waterfall plunged into the middle of it as if diving into a black cellar. So good. Anyway, highly recommend. All right, something completely different. Let's just get our other winter book out of the way. Also a pick from the Scandinavian countries. Thank you for the great literature. Oh my gosh. This is Moonland Midwinter by Tove Jansson. Tove Jansson is a Finnish writer um, and she created the Moonland world, which I recently learned was also a TV show, but is also a book series following the Moomins who I've also learned are not animals. They're closely related to trolls or some troll-like creature, but this one was a gift and it was sent to me and you said it was perfect to read in winter and specifically January. And so I did. I read this book over a period of three days in bed and all exclusively while it was snowing outside and it was beautiful. It was also the perfect companion to The Ice Palace, which I read in the dark dark winter nights when I was feeling absolutely awful myself. This was like a nice morning snow read. So it was just like this really good balance. But anyway, you can read the series out of order. I believe this is like the fifth or sixth one or something like that. Um, but this one, you follow Moomin Troll, who is I think the youngest son, uh, but the Moomins sleep through the winter. They hibernate, but Moomin Troll accidentally wakes up in the middle of winter and he has no idea what's going on. He's never experienced winter before. The rest of his family remains sleeping. He can't wake them up and he is so terrified, but also curious. He's very driven to see what is out there and the way that the world has changed because for him, like seeing snow for the first time, seeing the way that it falls, seeing the people that um, he's never seen before because it's a whole different world world in the winter. It was just so wholesome, so sweet. It is a children's series, but Tove Janssen like inserts so much philosophy and like really captures things that are so um, real and so important and also really hard topics to talk about. A lot of this captures a lot of that seasonal upset feeling where you're just waiting for spring. Moomin Troll really starts to hate the winter. He becomes scared of it. Um, he becomes very depressed. He becomes really angry and starts to shout at the sun like where have you gone um, but then you slowly slowly start to see him kind of appreciate the winter see the beauty in it and try to live in it and just live through it because he knows that the sun is going to come back pretty much all of this book takes place in darkness he makes different friends and it's just really really sweet but as well like i said it does deal with death feeling so isolated feeling so alone like i feel like this book really captured um, that just like hopeless feeling on winter nights that are so long and seem to go on forever or winter days depending on where you live that are just so dark. This book is also really beautifully illustrated. There's so many beautiful illustrations that um, just really, really make it. And it's just, I love this book so much. It was so sweet, so real, and it was just the best companion ever. I will definitely be reading more of these. I also have um, what is the other one? I think I have Moom and Papa at Sea on my shelf, so I'll definitely save that one for summer. I'm so glad I got to this one. So that is Moom and Land Midwinter. I gave this four stars as well. Really loved it. All right, then we have Fortuna Sworn. January was also a month of rereads for me. We read three, maybe four-ish books this month, which was just so fun. 
um, rereading books that you know you love is just something amazing. You'll always get something new out of it and it, it just adds so much enjoyment to your life. This was actually my first time physically reading Fortuna Sworn, which is the first book in the Fortuna Sworn Dark Fantasy Romance Fae series by KJ Sutton, which I adore. Previously, I had listened to this on audiobook. And speaking of audiobooks, if you are trying to meet your goal, maybe you set like a Goodreads goal or just a goal of books that you want to have read by the end of the year, it's a set number or whatever, um, something that always helps me to get to that goal which I really don't hold very much importance on. I just enjoy reading regardless of how many books I read, but audiobooks um, are just always phenomenal to help you out. You can listen to them anywhere, anytime. They're a perfect companion. So I'm so thankful to Audible for sponsoring today's video. You've probably heard me talk about Audible, but they are the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. Audible has the widest selection of audiobooks ranging from new releases to bestsellers. At Audible, you get one audiobook credit a month to spend on whatever audiobook you want, and you get to keep that forever, which I'm so glad about because I did spend a few of my credits on Fortuna Swarm books and they are still in my library to this day a year later or two years later whenever it was and I'm definitely going to be re-listening to them because I think the audiobook narrator as well is just so perfectly married to Fortuna Warren's voice. She does such a great job. I think her name is Emmy too actually but I did want to mention the Audible Plus membership because with an Audible Plus membership you get access to that one credit but you also get full reign over the Plus catalog which does include thousands of audiobooks as well as different things like podcasts. Um, they also have sleep tracks on there that are very nice, calming, ASMR-like things to help you get to sleep or just help you unwind and relax. With Audible, you can listen offline, anytime, anywhere, on the bus to school, doing the dishes. The Audible app is also free to download and is easily installed on any smartphone device or tablet device too. So yeah, if you guys want to check them out, I highly recommend. I've been using Audible for a long time. I really love them. You can click the link in the description to visit audible.com slash Emmy. That's audible.com slash Emmy. Or you can text Emmy to 500, 500 Thank you guys so much for sponsoring this video um, and I guess I should tell you a little bit more about this too. So in Fortuna Sworn, uh, we're following Fortuna who is a nightmare. She is trying to save her brother, Damon, who went missing two years ago. She lives in the small town called Granby where she is a waitress um, and it just, I don't know, it just, I really relate to her um, because like I have a younger brother and I used to, well not a waitress, I was a hostess at this um, Italian restaurant and it just brings back all the nostalgia of like <laughs> rude customers and stress, but also like that nice, calming, repetitive feeling that you get working at a restaurant. Um, but more than that, this Faye shows up uh, one night and says that he knows where her brother is. They can go to him if she marries him. So she's like, okay, where's the dress? Um, and they get married and they go to the Unseelie Court. The first book is actually my least favorite in the series. Um, I think it progressively gets better and better as it goes along, honestly. I restarted it because the fourth book came out in January and I bought the whole series and I just started reading them again because I wanted to refresh. I wanted to see like behind the scenes and there, there is, right? I feel like that's one of the good markers of a book if you go back and reread it and suddenly it illuminates so much that makes so much more sense now um, as a second or third time reader. This was just great. I feel like KJ Sutton's writing is so perfectly married to the genre, which is so nice, so rare. It feels very natural and I just love it. These are honestly the most addictive books like they're just so addictive um i feel like that's the perfect word for them the perfect word for the series they're so quick to get through i think these are perfect for a reading slump um and they do also handle a lot of dark topics though so do be aware of that but yeah i just really love it and i do have the second book on my tbr for february so i'll definitely be rereading or re-listening to that whatever the case may be so I'm so glad I reread this. I gave this four stars this time. The first time I read it, I gave it three stars, but I've just, oh, I just really think the series gets better as you go along and like knowing what I know now reading this, I'm like, okay, very cool, four stars. All right, I think then we have my least, maybe my least favorite read of the month, unfortunately. And that prize very recently has been awarded time and time again to the one, the only Mr. Leo Tolstoy. Oh boy. So for the Dickens versus Tolstoy book club in January, we read The Raid as well as the Sevastopol sketches or Sevastopol stories, which are two short stories by Tolstoy. Um, so this collection, this one is The Cossacks and other stories. This guy has Sevastopol. Oh gosh, these two stories are quite similar. They're Tolstoy talking about war, meditating on war, but a lot of it is a meditation on why men have this necessity or drive to become war heroes like why 
Are they so obsessed with being heroic? What does this mean? Um, it's not what they think it means. A lot of them are so disillusioned, so caught up in these notions of honor and virtue and glory, which are just meaningless when Tolstoy you know, creates a scene of arriving at the battlefield and you have thousands of people men and women and children um, dying and suffering and going through this awful time. Um, but then you have these higher up people who are obviously not really experiencing the same things, the same atmosphere, the same violence, the same suffering, who are just so preoccupied with their notion of glory, um, with being a good soldier for Russia and everything like that. Um, so the Sevastopol uh, sketches takes place during the siege of Sevastopol from 1854 to 55, I believe, yes, um, during the Crimean War. I think it's a good idea to do a little bit of research on the Crimean War before getting into this, which is what I did, because I really did not have very much information on um, that topic. So what I don't like about this is pretty much the same things that I'm really not liking when I read more and more Tolstoy. It's very repetitive. Um, War and Peace, if you've read War and Peace, you'll know that he does repeat himself endlessly with his ideas. He likes to throw them at you, shove them down your throat time and time again. I love War and Peace, one of my favorite books of all time, but I will say that it is repetitive to a fault almost, I would say. Um, and unfortunately in both The Raid and Sevastopol particularly, it does that time and time again. It almost uses the same lines just with the grammar or syntax switched up um, and made into something almost new, but really just once again spewing the same ideas at you, but I think these ideas um, don't stick as well as they do in War and Peace because in Sevastopol you do not have any time to get attached to the characters and actually I found this book to be really scrambled. They are all called sketches or stories, so there is some of that inherently supposed to be in their nature, but I was really confused as to what characters were what. We kept switching back and forth between perspectives, um, between styles of narration, and really not spending very much time at all with any one person getting to know them other than I feel like they were actually fit into quite generalized caricatures of, you know, um, the coward or the hero or the good man or the kind nurse. And so I really didn't feel any connection to them. And so when we would have a few paragraphs talking about you know, someone dying, which was tragic and awful, but then Tolstoy would, would be like, okay, now let's meditate on why this is wrong and why this is happening. And he would try to drop these really beautiful lines that did not come off in any way, shape, or form, or even affect me at all, because I did not have any time to get invested in what was happening. And besides that, those lines are doubly unsuccessful because what he is actually saying to me is basic knowledge is <laughs> something that is not very profound, not very hard to disentangle, not very hard to figure out or think for yourself. Obviously during the time period, I'm sure this was different because there were these people who were just so preoccupied with gaining honor for their country. And of course this is still happening literally right now in this book, just in this work of fiction fiction, the sentences that he is constructing to talk about, you know, glory and whatever, not only are they repeated and so take away from that luster and take away from that poignancy of them, but to me they really don't do anything because, because I already know this, if that makes sense. I also think it might be a bit more nuanced actually than Tolstoy is um, portraying some of these people in here. I won't say too much more about this because we will have a live show debate on Carolyn's channel over at Carolyn Mary Reads, um, I believe the first weekend in February, but we will post on Instagram um, and as well I'll let you know in probably the video description or in our next video. But I just think it is missing a bit of nuance and a lot of these characters seem to be just boiled down to something that Tolstoy can then write a few lines about. And the last concrete thing I'll say is that I think he's a bit of a naive idealist because there is a lot of nature. We have Tolstoy's nature writing back, which is what I missed a lot from Resurrection, which is the last full novel I read by him. But the nature writing is gorgeous. It's a great parallel. There's a lot to discuss there, even though a lot of it I feel like is basic and is also repetitive in the nature writing side of this um, storyline. But what I was trying to say is that he'll say things like, oh, one would think that if these soldiers could only walk through the grass or be close to nature, all trace of evil would vanish from their humanity. All trace of evil and the desire to fight and cause violence would disappear from mankind. Um, and I'm like, that's a nice thought. That is so unrealistic, so not gonna happen. Um, and I don't think it's a helpful thing to have alongside your 
almost manifesto against war, just this completely unrealistic solution that is clearly not gonna happen, as nice as that would be, as great as that would be. It feds me up, it feeds me. I'm fed. Fed up, it, fe it feds me up? Oh geez, I'm fed up, I'm fed up. I get fed up at Tolstoy. I gave this three stars, but definitely not a new favorite and it, it is just kind of rehashing the problems, the dislikes and the critiques that I have with Tolstoy. I was just talking about another book I love. I think pretty much the rest of these, I really did like all of them. So I read A Dowry of Blood in January too. This was sent to me as a gift from all the way from France. Thank you so much. This is from Morgan. And I had read the first few pages when she sent it to me, like the day that I got it. And I just got hooked. And I was like, okay, I'm literally not even going to put this on my bookshelf. I'm just going to leave it sitting out because I know I'm going to pick it up and read it. I flew through this. I first heard about this just on booktube because it got so popular and I can see why, like totally agree. This is a gorgeous, so lyrical, so lyrical. Mm, water, ocean, river, beautiful. Reimagining of Dracula's brides. S.T. Gibson decides to write a relationship that is so toxic, so abusive, and there's so much going on in this relationship that is just so hard to read about. And like, you really feel it. You really feel like that suffocating small feeling that our protagonist is feeling. So mainly we're following Constanta, who in the year, I think like 1200 and something is dying and Dracula. I'm not even going to call him Dracula because he's actually stripped of a name in this book. So a vampire um, comes up to her and turns her into a, his bride, another vampire, and they go and live through the centuries. This book um, takes place all the way from the year 1200 and something up until I believe the 1950s. So a huge, huge span of time and she dances between so many cities so many cultures, so many lives, so many people, so beautifully. And at first it is just Constanta and her husband, um, the vampire, for a very long time, but you can already see that things are just not right. They're not okay. Um, he's not a good, uh, good immortal being at all, and she becomes quickly miserable. There's so much gaslighting, so much abuse, so much, oh, just a violence, small violences, everyday violence. Um, it's just so awful, so hard to read about, but it's so beautiful to read about at the same time because of some of these lines. Like, they're just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Every single line I just wanted to underline, and it's just so impressive um, that that constant stream of gorgeous writing can be kept up throughout the whole book because it was amazing. One of my only critiques is that I just honestly wish this had been longer. We do meet a few other of the vampire's brides or consorts or whatever you want to call it that come into their life and I just feel like I didn't have as much time to get connected to some of them as I would have liked because they were super interesting characters too. Um, so yeah, I just wish this was like a series or a whole novel, but I think it is very powerful being a short piece of uh, literature as it is. And it is uh, an epistolary novel as well. It is told in letters to the reader and we have Constanta from page one trying to justify her decision to ultimately kill her husband, um, kill the vampire and his life. And um, she is writing to him. This whole book is also set in second person, which I think worked perfectly. It was great. It added to that sense of uneasiness, especially since you, the reader, are being addressed as this manipulative, thousands of year old creature. Um, and it just did such a good job at really getting that sense of a life that is stretched out far longer than it should ever be, especially when it is lived next to people who make that eternity, hellish eternity, an awful hell-like hole um, for the rest of your life. So yeah, I love this. Four stars, probably even four and a half, maybe five now that I'm thinking about it. I just really adored this and I want more is all I can say. I just want more so badly. So that is A Diary of Blood. Uh, the first book I read in 2022, all the whole year, I started it off with Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. Um, I listened to this one on audiobook and this was my first wolf as well. So that was really exciting. This book was so impressive, amazing, groundbreaking, revolutionary, so insightful, insightful, psychological, uh, going into someone's mind. Like it literally felt like this book drilled a hole into someone's mind um, and decided to just soak up the person's brain juices 
and put them into a book, as nasty as that sounds. It was phenomenal, it was amazing. However, did I enjoy it as a reading experience or a listening experience? Not really. That one's a doozy, right? It's always hard when you, like, you appreciate something so much. Like, I, what do I appreciate? I appreciate really beautiful cakes. I appreciate ice cream cake, but I hate ice cream cake because it is so, it's too sweet. I don't like it. I don't like the textures. I don't like the coldness. And then you have this like goopy, um, cakey stuff and all those layers. I really like how it looks. I really like how it's created. Kudos to other people who enjoy it. I just don't like ice cream cake because that's who I am as a person. That's my personal taste. And it was like the same thing with Mrs. Dalloway. This was like ice cream cake. So it always feels like you're kind of balancing. I, I just felt like with this one, I was balancing on rating it between, you know, enjoyability and um, amazingness because this is a fantastic piece of literature. Actually, the other day in class, one of my professors said that this is the best novel ever written. And I was like, oh dear, I do not like the best novel ever written. And that's okay. That's completely okay. You do not have to like a classic just because it is a classic. But let me tell you about this because I think a lot of people would love it. Virginia Woolf is a genius. And Mrs. Dalloway follows one day, one day in the life of Mrs. Dalloway, who is very much the society woman, who is very much a woman who likes to stay at home, likes to give parties, likes to be the talk of the town, likes to be very frivolous and extravagant, and just have the seemingly basic life, or a life that a lot of people, and even still today, would look down at her for choosing to live or choosing to have. But for her, that life is a life. There's nothing that makes someone else's life more lifelike than someone else's. There's no definition, and Virginia Woolf really just throws that in your face in this book because this book feels like you lived a century um, in one day and you just follow Mrs. Dalloway in her mind and the minds of a few other people in her life that she's now connecting to going throughout her day. She'll start by going to, you know, a flower shop and then she'll smell something or she'll see something and all of a sudden will be catapulted back 50 years or 20 years or whatever to a time in her life that she's remembering something and that's completely valid because when you're going about your day you are constantly engaging with your memories if it is, you know, consciously or not, but all of the time that precedes you, that whole life that you lived is still in your everyday. You bring it with you every single day. And so one day is never this meaningless thing. One day is your whole entire life really wrapped into one. It's all you're ever going to know, um, I guess, in your physical body in the present moment. And Virginia Woolf, oh my gosh, it's just so brilliant. That's what I'm saying. It's so brilliant. And I just wish I would have enjoyed that brilliancy a little more. I think the main thing to me was that I'm just not really a fan. It doesn't like keep my attention, that stream of consciousness-esque writing. Um, it is very meandering. The sentences are very long. There's no plot. You're just this ever stretching, ever tangling thread going through her life. And it's such an impressive, so realistic weaving and flowing and falling and sometimes breaking or losing a mini thread there or a piece there and it's so good it just shows you that no matter what you do your life is full of meaning whatever you think isn't important is probably extremely important this book also deals with so much mental health and it does combine a lot of discussion about mental health or lack thereof in fact neglect of mental health with neglect of women's lives but also this belittling or looking down upon um, or seeing this, you know, society gossip or party giver, party goer's life as meaningless and inherently unintelligent or inherently missing something. This book is so hard hitting, like one minute we're going from prancing around the park, looking at ducks, um, the next we're going through this soldier's mind as he is reliving his time on the battlefield. Oh my gosh, amazing, 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 amazing. So I really truly only have good things to say about this book. It's just on, you know, my own personal level of enjoyment. I just didn't like it and that's not necessarily even a bad thing to say about it. That's just a, a judgment, a taste. This is fantastic. Um, it really was fantastic. So that is Virginia Woolf and I will be reading more Virginia Woolf, of course. So that is Miss Stalibu. Oh my god, I just fell over. Then I finally did it. I finally read Lord of the Rings. Oh, oh my god, that says I have the world. Okay, <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna put that joke in. I think people are gonna get mad at me. It's a joke.
It's a joke. I listened to the Eye of the World audiobook because it came into my audiobook library and I was like, let's do it. I'm ready. I'm so ready. I always love reading fantasy books in the winter. I think they're the perfect companion, especially if they're a longer fantasy book. And man, The Eye of the World by Robert Jordan. This is the first book in the Wheel of Time series. I think, how many books are there, guys? 14? 15? 16? I think there's 14. I also first heard about this book on booktube uh, a very long time ago and the synopsis on the back is so vague that I won't even bother reading it to you. I think what I'd rather do is give you a little bit of an idea um, what it's about and I will not just say Lord of the Rings because that is a little bit diminishing but also not really. But regardless, we have a small village called Emmonsfield and in Emmonsfield there lives a young man. He's a little bit daft, honestly. I didn't really like our protagonist. Um, his name is Rand and he's just been farming sheep, you know, living the life. He's got his little cottage core dream with his dad, who's pretty cool, and he's just happy farming sheep and living his life with some of his friends and he's having a great village life, honestly living my dream life. But then everything changes when the Fire Nation attacks, when his village is attacked by Trollocs, who are creatures of the Dark One, and he is all of a sudden whisked off on an adventure with uh, a few other of his friends with kind of a wizard-like figure named Moraine. So that is the plot that I'll give you. And then pretty much this book follows them on their huge adventure. I want to say it feels like not a lot actually happens in this first book because so much of it does take the time to literally travel. Like it's very realistic in how long it takes to get places. The actual time spent traveling to these places does feel like the time you know, he takes to to write to write it. It feels like you go on this huge adventure. So at times, I, it definitely felt like a slog because so much of it is just travel, travel, minor conflict, travel, travel, a little bit of a bigger conflict, travel. There's some lore dump. There's some character dump. Um, but overall, I actually really enjoyed this. I gave this three and a half stars. I couldn't give it the full four star. Um, I've since heard a lot. If people talk about why it is so like Lord of the Rings, that's just what um, did not make it as enjoyable for me. I, it just felt very predictable in that way. And I will say as well, um, not on the Lord of the Rings tangent, just in this book in general, a lot of it felt a little bit juvenile to me. Like it felt like I knew what was happening. Um, a lot of the characters seemed just a little bit young in my mind and it just felt like it was written. It felt like a kind of a young fantasy actually. And I know this is from 1990, but it was just really interesting to see that shift I think that's taken place because this just, this just felt a little rollicking and frolicking. Um, and the writing even sometimes was a bit young. It felt very predictable in what was going to happen. My favorite character is I think Perrin. I really like Perrin. He is one of the other boys from Emmons Field. And I really like Lan. Come on. I like Lan. One great thing I do have to say about this book is that there were women. Like, it makes me so freaking happy, um, especially in the year that this was written, to feel like I was reading Lord of the Rings, but with women also going off to save the world and not, you know, staying at home or doing whatever. Um, some of the most powerful, interesting, coolest characters in here are women, and they have such an active role. Um, they're just as interesting as their counterparts as their companions and it was so rewarding to see that throughout the whole book time and time again like it was just actually incredible like i cannot tell you how amazing that feels um to see that to see to see it like that's incredible that's amazing um but on the other hand why i didn't get the full four stars is because um <laughs> just literally too many similarities to lord of the rings you know we have the shire feeling we have the wizard feeling we have the gandalf like feeling and i know a lot of this is intentional because i've been reading a lot of your comments too but it did just like it was just too much for me honestly we had like the orcs and um the ring wraiths we have, you know, the big long river with the huge statues of kings. We have the ring wraith people who are even scared of water or to cross water. We have objects that are infused with the dark one's power to kind of corrupt whoever is carrying that said object. Um, okay, the last one I'll say, just so you know, I'm not making this up, is Mount Doom. <laughs> From Lord of the Rings, but then we also have Mount Doom in here, spelled D-H-O-O-M. So sly. You got me, Robert Jordan. I did really like this. I just couldn't give it the full four. I will definitely be continuing on with the series. I do hope the magic system gets a little more solidified because I've heard that he didn't really have it fully figured out when he was writing the first book. And so a lot of it just feels like 
wait, what is happening? Um, or what does that mean? I really felt like I had to refer back to the glossary far more than I should have been because I feel like some things kept changing definitions almost, if that makes sense. But anyway, uh, I'm really glad I read this and I'm so proud of myself because this was a long, long journey. So I would recommend this, but do be prepared that it is very much like Lord of the Rings. I think I honestly would have liked to have known that going in because I might have chosen actually to just reread Lord of the Rings rather than get into this right now to satisfy that fantasy craving. But anyway, this has been a super long video. These next, uh, oh my God, six books I don't have too much to say about. So uh, we have The Raid by Tolstoy, which I already briefly talked about. The Raid is only 28 pages. It is in this edition of Tolstoy stories. And The Raid to me, what I will say, it literally just feels like a mini, mini section, a baby piece of War and Peace taken out of War and Peace because this was written before War and Peace. So it kind of just felt like Tolstoy brushed up the raid a few years later and put it into War and Peace, which I think actually I'm convinced is what happened. But this as well is about war and about people taking orders, not really thinking about it, just being in that military mindset um, and also wanting to be heroes and also the futility of war. So very common Tolstoy. So I also gave the raid three stars. Next up, I finally finished Neon Gods by Katie Robert in January. I have been reading this for so long, which is not a good thing to say about a very quick romance that you should just speed through. I first heard of this on Book Talk, and I, I don't think I'll be trusting Book Talk anymore because I did not love this. This one got so much hype. Um, on there. This is also a dark romance retelling of Hades and Persephone, but it's really not like it's literally just a mafia romance packaged and marketed as Greek. Like it's just like they have Greek names, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? I think if you read it, that makes sense because I was, I was really disappointed with this. In this one, we're set in this city where we have the upper half, which is basically all of the gods of Olympus, and then the lower half where only Hades lives, but no one really knows where Hades is, if he's even alive. Um, he's just like the boogeyman of their city. Uh, Persephone's mother engages her to Zeus without her knowing, and Zeus is obviously this awful man. He's said to have killed like three of his wives, and so Persades. Did I just make a ship name? Persephone. I tried to say both of their names at the same time. Persephone just runs to the lower city where she meets Hades, finds out that he's actually real, and essentially they kind of team up because they find out that they have a common enemy. Um, so repetitive, so repetitive, such a repetitive book. I just feel like a lot of romance books get stuck into this like copy paste, copy paste, copy paste, especially with the smut. Like they just do one thing and they're like, okay, cool. They're just gonna do that thing for the rest of their lives forever. This book was honestly just kind of boring to me. I did give it three stars only because like, I really don't feel like I'm a good enough, well-rounded romance reader yet to you know have a good idea of what's out there. I really haven't read that much romance in my life yet. Um, so I feel like once I read more, this would definitely probably be bumped down to a two star. I wouldn't really recommend, honestly. I don't think it's anything special. Definitely not a new favorite. So that is Neon Gods. Then I reread as well Rilke's Book of Hours. This was a buddy read I did with some of my friends. So nice, so gorgeous, so beautiful. This is poetry that is just heaven touched. Like literally the gods have touched Rilke and he is writing and it is gorgeous. I'm too alone in the world, yet not alone enough to make each hour holy beautiful 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 five stars it's just amazing and this book will always just be my book all right last reread i got to reread frankenstein i read this over a pretty long period of time but this was for uni this is for uni class and i loved it i actually gave it the full five stars this time just because like freaking fantastic if you haven't read frankenstein i don't think i have to say anything about this um read it it's actually just incredible like one of the greatest things ever written, honestly. I think, I'm hoping I'll be writing a paper on Frankenstein actually for this class. I haven't really decided yet, but I do have to make a decision somewhat soon. And this just seems like the logical choice because it's just so freaking cool. Um, but I don't really know what to talk about. There's like endless things to talk about in this book. Like it's incredible. So thank you. Thank you, Mary Shelley. Okay. And finally, the last two works I read in this poor, miserable textbook. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Norton Anthology. I read the play Volpone by Ben Johnson, which is for my Renaissance course. I really detested this, really didn't love it. Very not enjoyable. I gave it two stars. 
This is about Volpone, who is the trickster fox figure, and he is very rich, but he's trying to convince everyone around him that he is actually dying so that they will give him, you know, money. They will come to him and comfort him, give him some riches or whatever, and he'll put them in his will. And then when he dies, they'll get so much money, um, but he's not actually dying. This was just, uh, I just really was not interested in this play in any which way, honestly. So that is Volpone. And then for my other class, I also read Ulysses by Tennyson. This is a poem, but Goodreads did have it. So I'll just talk about it here too. Um, Ulysses is about Odysseus returning home to Ithaca after the Trojan War. And he hates it. He wants to leave immediately. He wants to go back out um, to sea and go on another adventure. He hates stasis he hates being stagnant he hates his wife he hates his son he hates his people he hates his island he just wants to go back in the open water um it's a really beautiful poem oh my gosh it's so so gorgeous so i highly recommend reading that poem it's pretty short as well but yeah those were the other random little bits and bobs i read in january it was a really good reading month um i had such a good time reading everything and everything was just really, really great. I loved all these books. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you're doing well. Once again, the Audible link is in the description if you want to go give something a listen. Have a great time with that, and I will see you very soon in my next video. If you made it all the way to the end, you're a trooper. Leave, um, oh my gosh, what should you leave? Leave me a candle emoji. I didn't really talk about this candle, but it is snow and ice and it has a polar bear on it. I'll see you guys very soon in my next video. So much love to you. What was your favorite read of January as well? I'd love to know. Thank you guys if you send me any of these. I absolutely love them and I'll see you next time. Ciao.